Welcome everybody to this conversation uh, hosted by the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. My name is Oscar Sinclair. I'm talking with the Reverend Kara Rockhill, an old and dear friend of mine. Um, Kara, I'm trying to remember the name of the church that you serve. I am at St. Andrew's Church in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Marblehead. And how, how's the weather in Marblehead these days? Uh, well, I don't know, because I live in Cambridge, uh, oh, right. and thanks to quarantine, I, I don't get to Marblehead very much, uh, but Massachusetts is actually nice today. Yesterday, it felt like winter again, but today, I think we're back in the 50s, and the skies have cleared. It's, it's actually not bad today. That's good. Not as nice as Nebraska, though, I hear, which is a you strange know, thing to say. Uh, well, less than a week ago, it snowed four inches here. So we only got one and a half. So. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's nice enough here. Um, so you and I, uh, while neither of us are Methodists, met at a Methodist seminary. Um, yeah. And the the question that I learned from the Methodists that I often start these things with is is to ask, "How are things with your soul?" Yeah, I ask that too. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that our like first day? I think it was. It was yeah. we whatever the class was, it was at Wesley Downtown. Uh, yeah, and we got to send them small yeah. group. <laughs> that was the one, and we always started with how is how is it with your soul? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, my soul is still trying to figure out how to be a priest in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, to be perfectly honest, okay. um, we spend. You know, I spent my entire shaping experience uh, learning about community and how to build community and how to be in community. Uh, and then, um, and spent a lot of time working on digital community as well. But right. all of that was rooted in a combination between digital and in-person. And so trying to help people be connected and trying to help people who can't physically be in the same space is proving uh, an interesting challenge, um, to say the least. Uh, so I'm, I'm still in a, an uncertain place with my soul, but overall good. Um, everybody I love dearly is pretty healthy, which is good, and I'll take it right now. Yeah, yeah. How is your soul? Uh, it's, it's good. Um, as, as we were talking before we started recording, you saw a little bit about how chaotic my soul is, uh, today, but, um, no, things are good. You know, we're, we're in this weird time right now, I think, where, um, professionally, we, you know, we shut down the, the physical building on March 15th. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, we had about two or three weeks there where we were in just absolute crisis, get everything shut down, figure out how we're going to do pastoral care, how we're going to do worship, how we're going to, you know, maintain the basic functions of the church. Um, and we did that well, I think, but, but now we're in this moment of like, Oh, all right, well, <laughs> we've got the basics running, but um, what are the, how, how do we build a community out of it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, without, without simply trying to replicate what, what has always existed at the church because we're not in a place where we can replicate it perfectly right now. Um, that's, I guess, how the church's soul is. My, my soul is pretty good. I'm, I am a, a deep introvert. Um, who was a Peace Corps volunteer. So you're like, tell me, Oscar, stay in this little room and, and record videos and, and think about stuff and write. And I'm, I'm actually pretty happy. Yeah, um, you got to stop being a baby. You're doing all right. Yeah. Um, so that, that's actually been a really, um, a little bit complicated, complicated of a piece of this for me is, is that personally, I've actually taken to this style of work, uh, you know, like a duck to a pond. Uh, and, uh, and there's all of this other stuff going on. Um, yeah. This is, this is kind of exceptional times. Um, I did want to 
circle back to something that you started with, which is how, how to be a priest in these times. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, because we are not from the same tradition, um, I guess the, the obvious question for my folks is what's, what is your conception of what it is to be a priest in, uh, in, in normal times, in three months ago times? I think that part, a big part of the priesthood, at least for the Episcopal priesthood, is, is the sacraments. And that's a huge part. It's a huge part of, um, in, in my tradition of why we're called, when we're, when we're called to ordination of the difference between being called to the diaconate and being called to the priesthood. Um, and, you know, being able to have and share Eucharist and baptism and you know, every, and you know, even and now, you know, anointing the sick and, and funeral rites, right, are all right. really important to priestly ministry uh and right now those are all gone right and um for many of us that that the sacraments and being called to the table the altar is is a huge part of why we became priests um and i mean you were with me in my call process uh mm -hmm. and i am I'm sure I told you, it's been a long time now, that performing the Eucharist was a big part of why I felt called to the priesthood. Sure. And, and now we can't do that. So, okay. um, you know, the, there are parts of our of peace, priestly ministry that still exist that we have to reform. You know, like, like pastoral, I think these are the things that we share, pastoral care and community care and social interactions even, like parts of the things that we as a church community foster for our larger community and for ourselves, we have to reevaluate how to do those with the added element of, well, how do we also make sure that, and, you know, people have groceries or if they're sick, that they have medications. Uh, and uh, so how to do all of that has been, is different. <laughs> it's been different. There's been a lot of zooming it really has. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, no, this, this chair is um, pretty well indented at this point. Yeah. And then I also have to like shift which room I'm in for what I'm recording and what time of day based on where the light is. Cause the first day I did the sermons, the light through the window went right across my face and a number of people were like, Oh my God, are you sick? And I was like, oh, no, it was, just, oh. it was just really bright, and I couldn't figure out where to put my head, and so then I started moving around. The office doesn't get the proper Wi-Fi signal, and the, the living room, which I'm in now, has the signal, but the dogs are like six feet away, so chaos could erupt at any moment. Uh, so, you yep. know, it, lots of things that you never thought about having to figure out as a priest, uh, a minister of any kind, and now you have to figure them out. Yep. But uh, I've actually feel really grateful that my community at St. Andrews um, really stepped up with wanting to take care of each other mm -hmm. uh, and in a way that made, uh, allowed, I think, the, the rector and I to take a nice deep breath, even, because people were immediately calling I me, mean, a dozen people immediately were like, how can I help? Right. Before we even asked. Right. We just like, how can I help? Uh, and we're not a huge community so a dozen people was a decent amount of us and and it was they're able to help and they're able to check on each other and talk and it's really i, I feel very fortunate for that yeah but it is, i mean it's interesting because the sacraments and, and sacramental ministry is so deeply embodied mm -hmm. like i'm i'm trying to we you know, we can get away with this theologically in, in the Unitarian Church, but we do, uh, we do a communion, and for us it's an ordinance, but we do it here once a year on Monday, Thursday. And, and we did it this year over Zoom, mm -hmm. um, because for us there's nothing particular about the, the clergy person blessing the, the wine and the bread. So each person had wine and bread at their house, but it's it's tough. It's a much different experience than the the sort of breathing the same air and eating of the same loaf. Yeah, that's really elemental to what what you do. 
Yeah, it is. And um, it's, it, it is an ongoing discussion. Um, at present, the, the bishops of the Episcopal Church have decided that uh, that, that uh, you know, having bread and wine in our individual houses is, is not going to work. No. So we are not doing that. Uh, and we're trying to figure out sacraments right now. Like, can we individually package wafers and mail them off to people? Or, like, how does that work? But part of it, like, theologically, um, I was, we met at Wesley, but I got sent to Virginia Theological Seminary, VTS, for a year yep. before they would actually uh, priest me. <laughs> it was fun for everybody. Uh, if anybody from VTS is watching, that made them laugh. Uh, <laughs> While I was there, one of the things I took away was that the thing that makes communion holy is not the magic hands that, you know, I spend all that time in seminary getting. It's the community saying amen at the very end of, of our communion prayer, of the Eucharistic prayer. That's what makes the, the bread and the wine holy. And that's what makes them a sacrament. And that is not possible right now. So from that respect, uh, I, I understand what the bishops are saying, but um, I would, you know, be open to conversations of, of how to do these things in different ways. Uh, I've been part of some of them before, and I think if this continues to stretch on as it is anticipated to do in states outside of the South right now, um, we may have to have some of those conversations. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, even, even beyond um, sacraments, I, I spend a lot of time talking about how the, the gathered community is, is what, is what the church is. Mm -hmm. The church is not the preaching moment. The church is not committee meetings. The church is not, you know, all of these things. The church is, is this group of a couple hundred beloved people who choose to be in, in relationship with each other. Um, and one of the things that I think a lot of us are trying to figure out, I know I'm trying to figure out, is what, it, is what that means to be a community of beloved people who are in relationship with each other when we're not physically present. Yeah, and fostering that relationship. Right. Um, you know, and, and that's always, that can always happen. I mean, I, I, I love my family no less for them living in New York and me living in Nebraska. We've figured out a way to, to maintain mm -hmm. connection. Um, and it's different and it's, it's in some ways harder. Um, and it takes more intention. Um, uh, but, but I won I haven't figured out how to how to directly uh, make that jump with the church. Um, I suppose if we had the answer to that, we would be, uh, you know, making a couple million dollars on a book advance right now instead of yeah, talking right. about a YouTube channel. But we'd be doing a lot more YouTube and yeah. podcast. That's for sure. Uh, I think that you hit the nail on the head with intentionality. Or, um, yes, it uh, you know, just coming right out of Lent, which is supposed okay. to be an intentional time. Uh, that being intentional is still really important. And I think for me that Lent, Lent isn't really over, right? Because mm -hmm. Lent ends with the resurrection. And, uh, you know, there has to be death in order for resurrection to happen. And Lent is that period of figuring out those things and what we can get rid of and what we need to keep. And I'm trying to approach this time as a way of intentionally looking at what are the practices that are good that we need to keep? Mm -hmm. What are the practices that aren't helping? What are the parts of our identities as communities, as, you know, as us for Christians, as y'all you know, for Unitarians, like what is it as part of our, our identities that we need to grow? Mm -hmm. What are the parts that are holding us back? And I'm trying to be really intentional about that time which is probably why things are a little shaky with my soul is because I'm, I'm trying to look at those things um, all at once. Mm 
right. while at the same time being nice and kind to myself because this is a stressful time. I don't have a puppy. <laughs> I have adult dogs and I do not have a child, uh, but it's still a stressful time. And, um, you know, holding space in my heart for the people that I know who are sick and, and who have died and holding all of those things together while taking an honest look at what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in community, what it means to go to church, what it means to be a priest. Yeah. Going forward instead of just in this time. Uh, and, and I think intentionality is important to that. And I think if we're intentional enough, and we all have to be intentional and approach things as practices instead of just nice things, but intentionally do things, we can remain in community and we can come back changed in a powerful, positive way. I hope. So what does that look like? I, and and I guess where I'm going with this question is there's, there's the old hymn, they, they will know that we are Christians through our love, through our love. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what does it look like to have those intentions? What does, what is your sense of, of what a community of, of faithful people looks like? What distinguishes a church from a civic organization that meets on Zoom? Yeah, I think part of it is the way that you're there for one another. Um, and I think that that's why you can find beloved community in a lot of different ways. But the, the intentionality of how are you there for one another? How are you caring for one another? You know, I, had a, I heard a story yesterday that uh, a parishioner, uh, I know that a, a parishioner has had a hard time finding eggs. Um, eggs are being price gouged in this particular part of Massachusetts. And another parishioner who is 20 years older was at Trader Joe's and got her a dozen eggs and drove them to her house, which is nowhere near <laughs> where, where the other parishioner lives. Um, just because they talked and, yep. and one had mentioned that eggs are being price gouged in, in her part of the state. And so the other person was like, oh, look, eggs, and just took them to her. And uh, I think the intentionality of actions like that um, you know, those, those are things that you do for people that you love. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if, if we're to be known by our, our love, COVID or not, then we have to find ways of being loving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly how it looks, Oscar. Uh, honestly, it's, uh, it's fluid and, you know, I could say for me, I, I shared this with you. I, I think I've shared it with my congregation, but um, I was tested for COVID pretty early in the quarantine process. And for me, loving community was the faces of every single doctor and nurse that looked at me in a way that said, we've got you and we're with you. Right. And this thing that is scary and that we don't know what's going to happen, we're with you. Now, I, I was COVID negative, for which I'm incredibly grateful. But like, I still remember the nurses. Like, you can't see their faces. <laughs> you can see that they're smiling and that they're, they're doing everything they can to convey that they're there for you. Mm -hmm. And that's intentional on their parts. And I think that if we outside of healthcare settings are intentional in the same way, that we can come out stronger than we went in. So one of the other places that, that we've talked about in the past and we brought up as we were talking about this conversation um, is what it means to disagree these mm. days. Yeah. Um, so I remember when we were, when we were in seminary at that first, that first class that we were in, mm -hmm. um, day one at Wesley, we were assigned to a small group of what, six people? Yep. Um, and it was... Uh, it was the fall of the 2012 election. Yeah. Um, and it was a mixed group politically. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and I remember one of our group mates after the election saying, gosh, I'm glad I was, I was in a group with you because meaning the two of us, because um, I feel better about Obama voters than I would have otherwise. 
So I actually, I know who you're talking about. Um, yeah. And I won't out him. Uh, but he was an older white man. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was also the election where at that point I was a Maryland citizen where I gained full That's citizenship right. rights. Oh, as that was. Person, um, which really pissed off one professor, not, not in that class, but yep. around that same week. Um, but I remember standing in, I think it was like December, uh, when for whatever reason, Wesley downtown, which is where that class met, was everything was locked. And we were standing, he and I were standing at like um, a check-in table somewhere and everybody else is looking around for a room. And we had a very long, intense conversation about politics on which we disagreed. And we just talked. And at the end he said, oh, so Democrats want the same things. You just want them in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes, like, we both want to take care of people. We want people to be okay. We just think that we go about it differently. And, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a year later, he and I sat down in the cafeteria, which I know has a nicer name. I don't remember it anymore. The refectory. Factory. There it is, the refectory. We sat down by some big window overlooking Massachusetts Avenue and sat and talked for quite a while about um, the Bible and being gay. Mm -hmm. Because he was working through that for himself and wanted to understand. And, you know, I was a out person at a place that had a number of theologically conservative people. So it was a conversation I had a number of times. But I remember that it, it was possible to sit down and disagree with someone mm -hmm. in, in a way in which you're just trying to learn from one another and understand one another's perspectives and experiences. Even if, you know, chances are good to excellent, you're not going to agree on the other side, but maybe you're taking a couple of steps closer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so I did that a lot there, especially yeah. with him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have the, the political thing, the political conversations as much at Wesley, but I, I had a whole lot of conversations about, wait, so what do you believe about Jesus? Yeah. And, and you're here? <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was, there was an intensity to those conversations for me that, that was, uh, it was both very draining at times. And, and there were definitely times where I, I told classmates of ours, like, I can't, I just can't engage with you. I can't do this right now. Yeah. Um, usually after they told me that if I, if I didn't believe that Jesus Christ was my savior, then I, I shouldn't be in seminary. That's usually about where I checked out. That's um, fair. Yeah. I think I did too, for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of conversation up to that point where, where if we could agree on, we're both supposed to be here. We both are authentically called in whatever way we define that sentence. And then we're going to work out what that means um we got a long way um i'm not sure how to do that outside a an in-person setting where you know you have a couple hundred people at the wesley campus who are told pretty explicitly you're all supposed to be here you're all called figure it out um especially now yeah. When, when the opportunity to sit down and, and hash it out over a cup of coffee is is much different. And we're all spending way more time on Facebook. Yeah. Home of nuanced political and religious yeah. discourse since 20, well, 2000. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's hard. I, um, like, earlier this week, end of last week, uh, one of my mom's friends on some post of hers called the World Health Organization a corrupt organization, to which I very gently said, I mean this sincerely, and I'm not trying to argue, I just want to know where you got this information from. Right. Like, and I, because it, it runs counter to what I know, so please tell me. And his response was, you're an idiot. Or maybe he said, you're ignorant. It was one of those two. He's used those words interchangeably 
directed at me at different points over the last few months, uh, neither of which are true. Um, and I was like, I was like I, I'm honestly just asking, <laughs> just point me to a Fox News article, yeah. please. Like, and, and I even looked and I didn't find one. So like, point me to this. I will, I just want to see where it's coming from. Uh, and you know, maybe this person is a bit of an extreme example, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to engage with facts, which isn't really helping. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know anymore. <laughs> I don't know anymore. Um, the world turned upside down before we had to stay in our houses. Uh, and now we're all in our houses. Yeah. Uh, and something that I think really should be unifying. Like we really should be coming together and saying, you know, we're all humans. Let's take care of each other. Um, let's find a way to support people who don't have paychecks right now. Let's find a way to support small businesses to fund programs better, to make sure people have access to healthcare. Let's, let's do these things together right now. This is the time. Uh, and unfortunately that hasn't been entirely the case. I've seen a good chunk of it. Actually, I try to focus on those things. Um, but the, the conversation with people who are further and further apart, uh, is is not getting any easier and i i guess i'd kind of hope that it would yeah. i remember um a couple of years ago oh i can't remember his name now um on being interviewed one of the um the commissioners of the um truth and reconciliation commission in, mm. in uh south africa it wasn't it wasn't desmond tutu um was a historian mm -hmm. um, and and he used the phrase that the the whole purpose of the truth and reconciliation commission was just to get people to listen to each other damn it yeah <laughs> and and at the time I just kind of went by as as a line but you know that that seems like <laughs> God, now that seems like such a high bar, like to, to just get people to, to listen for a moment. Um, and it feels like somewhere in there, there's a role for the church, for me. But yeah, I, oh, I agree, yeah. You know, the, the church, capital C church, is, mm -hmm. is one of the few sort of big institutions that has feet in many um, parties and, and movements. Um, but I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. I'd actually been talking about that since before the before times. Yeah. The well before times actually. Yeah. That, um, I think you can look back at trends in churches and see where, um, where we as pastors started to get worried about our numbers we stopped preaching as I would say, I would say true for a Christian, true to the biblical text, but we stopped preaching as hard of a message to hear. We stopped <laughs> preaching a message of, we have to have these conversations. You know, we have to live out these words. Right. Um, and, and so we in our mainline churches stopped knowing how to have these difficult conversations. And at the same time, we have this rise of literalism and fundamentalism that's like, just do these things and say these things and believe these things and you're good. But if you do anything else, you're wrong and you're going to hell. So where mainline churches are losing the ability to have conversations and as a result are kind of losing a sense of their beliefs, um, you're seeing a rise of this fundamentalism, which is saying, we believe this one thing on a silver platter. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, I think that's a big old problem really yeah. that, that church forgot how to have respectful disagreement. And I, um, I was, before I came up to Marblehead, I was on the staff of the Bishop of Rhode Island. Uh, and while I was there, I looked 
into a lot of the reasons of why people aren't in church anymore. Mm -hmm. Like why are young people not going to church and trying to, to look at some of the sociological trends. And one of the reasons that I came up with, and it's still, it's something that I don't have an answer to, but one of the reasons was why should I be in community with someone who doesn't think I should exist? Um, or who doesn't think my sibling should exist, or my friend, or my high school coach. Like, wh why Why should I be in community with this person? Um, and I don't have a great answer for it. <laughs> I, I sure. still don't. I'm, I'm the one who fled the South for, the, for New England, right? I don't have a great answer for why we should be in these communities. Um, and I keep searching. And I think if we can find an answer to that question, then maybe we can find the start of how to get back to respectfully disagreeing in a loving way. Yeah. Does that something happy, Oscar? Come on, do this. That's a. There's, oh, so there's a line out of universalism that I use a yeah. lot in these yeah. moments. Um, which is maybe not a happy line, but, but uh, it, it is, you know, God, God believes that everybody is precious and of infinite worth, and, and I am not God, um, and, and don't need to aspire to that in every moment of every day. I need to, to trust that that is the position of the divine. <laughs> yeah. um, and for me, that's, that's a really important starting point. That's, that's the, I think we work out all of Unitarian Universalist theology in between our, our ideas that each person has inherent worth and dignity and we are all interconnected. And if those two things are true, then we gotta figure out a whole lot about how we hold them in tension with each other. Um, and maybe that's a, that's a demon project that we'll talk about some other time. But uh, on a happy note, how are your your canine coworkers these days? My I've... canine coworkers are adorable, uh, both under a blanket at the moment. Um, but I've actually been very appreciative of my my little dog Dobby. I got um, yep. last October so twenty eighteen, uh, and very shortly thereafter, I had shoulder surgery, um, and he was just attached to me for that time period. Um, and I realized that his job was just to lay next to me and keep me warm. And he was really good at his job. And uh, I had surgery again in January and he was still good at his job. And he has been like loving working overtime the last <laughs> six weeks. He, he is just like, this is my job and I'm good at it. I am cute and I am next to you. And that is all. Uh, the coworkers are also sleeping in until like, 11 or 12 which I did not know dogs were capable of <laughs> ours is not no well yours is a yours is this big um oh. they're like they're they're you know standing up and stretching out around 10 and checking out what's going on and then going back to bed <laughs> sounds lovely <laughs> they come out and they're like we're hungry and like so we have teenagers is what's happened um and they're wonderful and very cute yeah, and actually, one of their, um, one of our parishioners, one of my parishioners, is a, is eleven, and her name is Macy, and she drew us this picture of them. Oh. Uh, and sent it, I guess, about two weeks in to this. That's adorable. So, there's Dobby laying on top of Tenley, which, um, so. Yeah, yep. the dogs are good. Yeah. Um, Thanks for asking. Well, and I guess then the, the one really important question to end on um, is uh, in, in, in demonstrating to our congregations that ministers have real lives. Uh, we are both uh, former champions of our fantasy football league. We are. Yes. Um, so very, I was very nearly a two-peat. Uh, and you would have been the second. I, I would have, other than you. I know. Um, I know. Yeah. Any predictions on who's gonna who's gonna take it this year, provided the NFL has a season? Provided, I mean, I think the safe money is always on one of us. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, I, I feel a little chip on my shoulder after the way I fell apart in the last game of the season yeah, last year real bad. In the championship game. Uh, you did not have a great season. I did not make the playoffs for the second you time in eight years. Very, although in your defense, and I don't think we said this nearly enough, you had a screaming two-year-old on your leg while you drafted. That's what I'm going uh, to say about the like At one point, I called in a pick for you. <laughs> Who, to your credit, you kept all seasons. So <laughs> was, um, but yeah, uh, I love our league. I, um, I, I do hope that our friend Margaret finally figures out how not to completely freak out when her team falls apart at some point because everybody's does. Yep. But she, and so now she has to watch this to see where we talked about her. I know we're, we're yeah. going to have to, and, and Margaret, when you're watching, there are options for, for socially distanced fantasy sports. We could all take up fantasy golf and uh, no, <laughs> no, we just got a game called jazz mitten which you can get on Amazon, oh. which is a paddle and a little foam ball. And it, has, and it has some little birdies. So you can hit it back and forth. So fantasy jazz mitten. I'll, we should, we'll recommend that. We'll we recommend should, that. yeah. Well, well it's, it's good to so see you, good. friend. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me in Nebraska before I could actually get to Nebraska. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. We should, um, we should actually talk because if we keep this up for a while, mm -hmm. you know, it's much easier to, to guest preach from across the country now than it. Oh, has. my God, I would, I would do it in a heartbeat. Here. I, pre I guest preached for you once before. I'll do it again. We should do that. They didn't, they didn't run me out of Baltimore. So hopefully, they, well, I will be too far away from. You did, you did guest preach in Baltimore. I did. Yeah, I did. For and you. Then, right. I, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, you were there. That was you. I, I was there. That was like yeah. that was many years ago now. That was before. I used a, I used a profanity, and my mother was there, and she was very mad at me. Yeah. Well, yeah. we get to do that. I I tell I tell my congregation I get at least one a week while we're in quarantine. <laughs> um, yep. All right. Well, <laughs> this has been the Reverend Kara Rockhill um, and Oscar Sinclair. Um, thank you so much. We'll thank see you. Soon. Peace be with you all.